the bloodiest day since the coup happened on the 1st of February. Uh, we had uh, today, only today, 38 people died. Uh, we have now more than over 50 people died since the coup started, and many are wounded. All right, well, joining me now is Azim Ibrahim, the director of special initiatives at the New Lines Institute, the author of The Rohingyas, Inside Myanmar's Hidden Genocide. He is also an adjunct research professor at the Strategic Studies Institute, U.S. Army War College. Uh, professor, at least 34 protesters were killed Wednesday across Myanmar, and there are reports that that death toll could actually be higher. These are peaceful protesters, but the response from the international community has been fitful, to say the least. Is there anything that can be done to stop this violent crackdown? Well, the international community has very little options, good options here, to actually put pressure on the Myanmar military. Uh, just today, we heard the deputy military chief, uh, So Win, saying that they're willing to weather any sort of sanctions, any sort of international pressure. They don't need international friends. We, he said very clearly that we are able to walk with very little friends. So it seems that they are in this for the long haul, that the pressure that we will not actually have much of an effect. I anticipate that, uh, you know, they are, they're, they are pushing the protesters in the hope that the violence will actually increase so that they can start justifying increased violence from the military and authority side. But as you said, 38 people have died in one of the bloodiest days, and I can only expect that this is only going to increase further. The UN Special Envoy, Christine schreiber Bergener described the crackdown today to reporters at the UN and made specific mention of a video showing police violence on medical workers. Now, health workers were the first to revolt against the coup. Do you think that's why we're seeing violence against medics now? And how concerning is that, uh, that healthcare workers are being targeted, especially in light of the pandemic? Well, this is obviously to indicate to make their life as difficult as possible to target the healthcare workers who are providing some sort of relief to the protest that, protesters that are under attack. So uh, targeting health workers makes everybody's life very difficult. Essentially, nobody is safe whatsoever. Usually in these circumstances, healthcare workers or doctors are usually exempt from any of the violence. They're clearly marked, but uh, it, sees, it seems very clear that the military is determined to make the lives of these individuals very difficult. And I, I don't anticipate the virus is going to change much uh, in the near future. I think until Aung San Suu Kyi and the 40 NLD leaders are imprisoned indefinitely, uh, I don't anticipate the military is going to give up any sort of leeway whatsoever. I think the, the probability of them having elections later this year will only happen in the eventuality that the NLD party is completely distinguished. So, I mean, you, you pretty much answered my next question about what you foresee in Myanmar in the short term. But I'm also wondering, um, as you said, that there's very little that the international community can do. What role can and should the United States take in trying to stop this violence? The U.S. is left with very few options here. This is President Biden's first foreign policy challenge. And it seems that uh, the military has already calculated that China is able to, you know, mitigate many of the sanctions that may be forthcoming. Myanmar's economy is very heavily reliant on Chinese investment. Uh, so they're hoping that the China will not only provide it with economic support, but also political protection at the Security Council for any sanctions or any political penalties that may be forthcoming. So as long as they have China on their side, they believe that they have uh, protection against any sort of action from the United States. So it seems to me that the U.S. strategy has to be to try to get China on board and try to make China to try to see the bigger picture here for stability in the region. All right, we'll leave it there. Azim right. Ibrahim, thank you for joining us today.